So we'll begin with about a half hour sit together, meditation. And I'll guide us through that. So go ahead and take a minute or two to find yourself a comfortable sitting position. And remembering that it's okay to take your time with this. Just asking the body what it needs for comfort. You might find that just asking that question is a kind of support. This kind of ritual or ceremony right at the beginning of a meditation period can be a sweet way of undermining this diluted view that somehow there's something that needs to be resolved or fixed. Right from the beginning, instead, we're remembering that every experience Every expression of life, whether pleasant or unpleasant, or neither pleasant nor unpleasant, every single experience is a force of nature. It's something that has arisen lawfully not something that needs to be fixed. This is really a kind attitude to bring to our practice. Just keeping wisdom in mind. Nothing needs to be fixed here. Nothing needs to be resolved. Every breath, every body sensation, every emotion is to be met, experienced, known, and released.
and trusting that this sensitive heart knows how to connect, knows how to feel, knows how to let go. This is also nature. There's no need to be afraid of what we might experience. No need to try to control anything. Everything moves, nothing sticks. Being willing to be sensitive what's moving right here. It can be felt and known. What can be released, not clung to. Let's continue in silence now.
And opening your eyes whenever you're ready. Thanks for your practice, everyone. Take a few minutes to stretch the body if you'd like. Even if you'd like to walk away from your screen for a minute, it's really okay. Also take a moment to take in the, the Zoom world and see if you can appreciate being here together or some aspect of being here together, that there is this place we can drop into to practice together. I'm wondering if anyone is here for the first time and if you'd like to unmute yourself and say hello. Well, let's jump in together. So I wanna talk a little bit about the hindrances tonight. Good topic, always relevant. And if you don't know what the hindrances are, that's okay. You actually do, you just don't know that you do. <laughs> There's this uh, wonderful song by this, this um, family band, Infinity Song, and they, they made a cover of the old BG song, How Deep Is Your Love? And I've honestly been listening to that song on repeat for so long. I'll forget about it for a few days and come back to it. I might. I hope I'll save a few minutes to play it for you at the end of the program, but it's been so meaningful. Music is such a powerful force. Art is such a powerful force. And for me, especially, um, and I think in any real uh, movement, you know, art has such a powerful place to sort of help us to find some balance in the heart and in the body so that we can find our way together. I've been, um, yeah, just learning, relearning the power of music and dance and body movement practices in community, um, even in, pro especially in protest spaces, direct action spaces where it just seems like the, the energy sort of can be moved in really healthy and useful ways through the power of art and music. And this has been one of those songs for me. And so when I hear it, it really has moved me in, in many different ways. And as I was listening to it the last couple of weeks, it, it sort of reminded me of the, the kind of resolve that's needed to um, work with the hindrances and Hindrances we might really globalize and ger generalize to mean these moments of confusion or difficulty um, when we're kind of pulled off our square or swept away by the forces in the heart and mind that are not really that useful and that pull us away from our sense of belonging to ourselves and each other. And so this wonderful song, How Deep Is Your Love is like, was, has like been for me a, a reminder to go to the deepest place where all of this can be okay. Where all of the, the problems of the world and the imperfections of this human experience can be okay. Like, sweetie, how deep is your love? Can you find this way to relate, you know? Even if you have to go to the depths of love to do it, is it possible? And as practitioners, you know, we tend to think that if we're practicing well, even after years of practice, this attitude can creep in. If we're 
practicing well, then things ought to get more pleasant, right? And if we're not practicing well, then, well, that's the reason why things are unpleasant because we're not practicing very well. And we can see this attitude creep in in the middle of a meditation or even as we go through our lives, like, God, I'm suffering. There's got to be some problem with me. Like, I should be able to overcome this by now. I shouldn't be full of rage. You know, I've been practicing for 20 years. And it's really not that way. <laughs> That's not how it is for any of us. And in fact, even the most experienced among us will say, well, yep, there's still difficult moments. And it's actually in the places where we feel the most stuck, where practice actually happens, right? We learn something about our capacity, which is really what we're here to create and is what the practice calls us to do, to learn how big we are, like how deep the love is, how strong we can be, how deeply we can understand this experience of belonging, what doesn't belong. And in this, in this way, as we kind of make our way through life and through difficulty, we learn how to really honor the wounding too. That's, that's it right there. We learn how to honor and accept and embrace even those stuck places, those places of psychological wounding, those, all the places of unfinished business in the collective, the, the wounding in the collective and these deeply ingrained habits that make themselves known, these resistances to change, these inclinations to take things personally, this fear of difficulty, this resistance of dukkha, of suffering. And it's this connection with or reckoning with what feels so ordinary that we sort of learn all that we need to learn to heal our own hearts and heal the wounds of the world. And that may seem like a really big statement and in some ways it is, but we can see how real it is in in the ordinary moments. So this teaching of the on the hindrances has been really important for me, mostly because as human beings, we spend so much time here in daily life that most of what we're doing is reckoning with the hindrances day in and day out throughout our day, off and on, quite often. We are hardly these very concentrated creatures who live hours and upon hours of in deep samadhi. It's not usually that way for us in our daily lives more. It's like, okay, well, there's greed in the mind and there's some kind of aversion here and there's not wanting this or wanting more of that and shutting down or disconnecting and just wanting to say, forget it all, being confused and swirling around in indecision. This is, isn't this most of the territory we find ourselves in? I mean, not if you're with me. <laughs> Thank you, Mary Benson. <laughs> I don't feel so alone here. So these, the hindrances, the hindrances from what? So the Buddha talked about these five primary preoccupations of the mind. Right, hindrances that keep us from seeing clearly and keep us from settling, keep the heart from settling, settling into its own sensitivity, settling into that places where the, the heart can feel in balance or equanimous, deeply connected and okay there. 
And it's so easy to get caught up in these preoccupations of our minds. The minds are always telling stories, right? Sometimes these, often these preoccupations are um, exposed through the thinking processes. So the, the things that we think about can expose the hindrances. And these five hindrances are, mm, they're basically the, uh, like on a spectrum, each of them on a spectrum from subtle to gross, but maybe the stickiest places where we can understand the forces of greed and hatred and delusion. And these words like greed and hatred and delusion can kind of be elusive to us. I mean, sometimes, and in other ways, we can really understand how deeply uh, invasive they are in the ways that our minds work. But when I say that they're, they're on a spectrum and elusive, what I mean is that they're easy to dismiss in some ways. Like we can, if I say greed, you might go, well, my mind doesn't really, isn't really that greedy, right? I'm not prone to addiction. Or if I say hatred, you'll go like, oh, I don't know. I'm not really full of hatred. I'm more full of love a lot of the time. Hatred is not my go-to. Or delusion, you're like, well, you know, that might be like a psychological disorder of delusion. It's not really my jam. But when we think about the spectrum of these forces, like the spectrum of greed, all the way from wanting to keep thinking a pleasant thought to the other end of addiction, colonization, imperialism, these massive forces that have defined who we are. So generally greed can be expressed as moving towards something, wanting this, even this most subtle, like wanting a piece of chocolate, which I love chocolate, so it's an easy example for me. And then again, this like spectrum of hatred from slight irritation, resistance, not wanting something to murderous rage, literally murderous rage. So in a general sense, moving away, subtly resisting something. And then all the forces of delusion from a disconnection from reality, like a deep disconnection from reality to turning away from something that we'd rather not see. Stuckness or spinning around and not getting anywhere, indecision. We've all found ourselves in these places probably where we've had a hard time making a decision and we just keep thinking the same thoughts, right? Not actually making the, not wanting to make the decision, but just continuing to loop with no new information. That's an, an expression of delusion. <laughs> and these three states are three motivations or three expressions, broad expressions keep us stuck in dukkha or suffering, that feeling of not feeling great or not feeling well. And when we're caught here, it hurts. So there are five flavors or root energies that are connected to these root energies of greed, of hatred and delusion. And it's these five flavors that we might call the five hindrances. They color our experiences. They actually, they color our experiences and they prevent us from seeing clearly the truth of our experience. Instead of seeing the force of self-hatred, we might actually believe that we are a bad person, for example, right? But when we can learn to see this, every get really interested in the force of self-hatred or any other expression of the hindrances, then we can learn how to not take it so personally. Like, oh, look at this. I've seen this so many times. It's really unpleasant, but it's actually not who I am. It's just a visitor that 
returns again and again based on conditioning and experience. And perhaps each of us are sort of geared a little bit differently. So there may be, um, you know, in this mind tends to gravitate towards the aversive experiences. And, you know, your mind might not be flooded with those the way that mine is. It's another mind might be more um, geared towards experiences of sensuality, wanting. You might notice the wanting more. I might notice the not wanting more. I was once on a retreat with a friend and <laughs> there's a talk on the hindrances and um, a little bit of time for Q and A. And all he said was, I'm so deluded. I don't even know what that means, right? <laughs> so, I mean, I tend to have a heavy dose of this in my personality too that and you might find yourself here like, oh, I don't even know. I don't even know what's in my mind. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm geared towards. I might call that an expression of delusion. So the Buddha uses lots of water images to make points in the scriptures. And this he makes, he talks about the hindrances. Um, he talks about the hindrances by using this image of a pond, right? So let me just name what they are, the five hindrances. Sensual desire, an expression of the wanting mind. Ill will, an expression of the mind that doesn't want or want, want like pushes something away. Lethargy and stupor, dullness, low energy states, the third one. Restlessness and worry is sometimes how it's translated, but perhaps restless, restlessness and regrets might be a, a better way to describe this one. Anxiety can mean such a wide variety of things for each of us that restlessness of, of the body and that regretful mind, like, oh, something, you know, doesn't feel good about how I've lived my, how, how I've lived my life. And then the fifth one is doubt and indecision. Okay, so in order to describe the hindrance of sensual desire, the Buddha talked about like a uh, putting, like if we were to put red dye into a, into a lake, it would color everything that we see, right? Instead of seeing clearly that this is just an experience that will come and go, we see it as something that we want, right? We mistake the reality of the body for lust as an example of this kind of energy, right? And so forget that all the ins and outs of what it means to have a hum human body and completely fantasize over something else as an example, right? But any sensual desire can fall into this category. And then, the Buddha used an example of boiling water to point to ill will. So if, if water is boiling, you can't really see into it. You can't see even your own reflection, even your own reflection. So ill will can be like this, right? It prevents us from seeing clearly into our, the goodness of humanity. It really, all that bubbling makes it impossible to see. And for this third hindrance of lethargy and stupor, using an analogy of a pond filled with algae or seaweed that's so thick and entangled, it's really hard to make your way through it. And then this fourth one, when the mind is filled with restlessness and regrets, using wind that churns up the water as a way of describing what this is like. When the wind churns up the water, you can't see the pond, you can't see into the pond. It's just too much wind. So when there's restlessness, worry, anxiety, regret, it's hard to see beyond that. We just are swept away by, those, by that wind. And then the fifth 
hindrance, doubt, and indecision can be marked by muddy water. So in mud, it's again, you know, no clear seeing here. You can't see into the pond and you cannot see your reflection in the pond. So doubt and indecision, it can be like this circular spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning like you're stuck in mud. And often, often we will experience one or sometimes we'll know a hindrance, we'll come to know a hindrance really, really well and experience a single hindrance and it's really obvious like, oh, there's a version in the mind. Or, oh, doubt can be hard to see, but sometimes it's after the, the doubt storm has passed that we can see, oh God, we're just really caught up in all of that indecision and it made it very very painful you know you can see how easily caught we can be by doubt or perhaps that sloth and torpor low energy states where it just feels like i don't want i can't make myself i don't want to i just want to you know lay here or sometimes can't even really move the body because it just that depressed feeling is there apathetic feeling is there. And sometimes we'll get to know the mind's inclination, right? That this mind might go to that as a good coping strategy or not really a good one, but it's go-to coping strategy. And then other times it might feel like, wow, this is, is kind of a hindrance storm or a hindrance attack where it's hard to see them. It's hard to really feel their difference their differences. It just feels like a lot of pressure or mess or like, oh, I, I don't even know what's happening here, but it doesn't feel right. Something like that. And in this language that the uh, teachings were written down in this language called Pali, this old language, the hindrances actually, it, the word is nivaranas, and it means coverings. So the hindrances cover over so we can't see what's there. They cover over often what motivates them. So one of the, I remember a retreat many years ago now but I had a teacher that was really interested and she kept asking this question, well, what, are, what is the limiting belief that's there? What is, the lim what is the belief that's beneath the surface? And so a hindrance can cover over the belief that is motivating the emergence of that expression. I don't know if you've had this experience too, or you have seen, it's like, you know, we can sometimes feel in that moment of connection with experience, that experience doesn't take over. We can watch it come and go, watch it come and go. Sometimes as the mind gets settled down in a meditation period, we can start to see like, oh, body sensations are here, emotions are here, thoughts are coming and going. And it, it feels like that's happening naturally. It's not a lot of sticking things are just emerging and then passing away like this. Oh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> oh, my point was that you know, in these in these moments when there's this coming and going, it can sometimes feel like, well, I've seen that a thousand times, and yet it wants to emerge one thousand and one times. Like that painful thing, like, oh, that's anxiety, watching anxiety come and go, watching anxiety come and go, watching, and yet anxiety just wants to keep coming and going, right? It would seem like it would wear itself out at some point, that the root of anxiety would eventually be plucked. But yet there's this um, coming, this continuous anxiety come. And so, you know, when we say it's not worthwhile to have a goal in mind, it's because we don't quite know the depth of that experience. That surface level anxiety might be 
covering something that goes really deep. And so this is where really having some honor for psychological wounding, honor for the deep patterns of the heart makes a lot of sense. Because even though we might see something that feels unpleasant, one of these hindrances, its roots might be really deep, deeply embedded. So we might have to see that one million and one times, two million and one times. We have to be willing to see that and still have some faith that that noticing and that watching something emerge and pass away is still valuable it's still, because it undermines its, its expression. And then in some moments we get a little deeper glimpse, like, oh, there's some fear there or there's not wanting to trust impermanence or whatever else that's there. And sometimes, sometimes it's a, a psychological pattern right, that these hindrances are covering up. Grief or loneliness, sometimes irritability can cover loneliness. Sometimes anger or rage can really cover up grief. Sometimes we'll notice feelings of inadequacy that are beneath the surface. So these hindrances are not foes. They're actually friends. It's our confused system's attempt at keeping us happy. And it goes to a quick and easy path there. And we get pulled into these hindrances so that we don't have to deal with what lies beneath. But this practice of becoming more and more sensitive allows us that greater path capacity to feel that, right? And when the heart can trust that, oh, this is, that sensitivity is trustworthy, then it can feel a little bit deeper. And that's where we start to get to the roots. So just some examples that sensual desire can often cover many patterns, but I mean, certainly these days I'm noticing how the wanting mind can cover up loneliness, feeling alone the way that we've been living, feeling disconnected. I mean, how, how often am I sitting here at my desk doing something, the same something that I did the day before and the day before that and the day before that. And, you know, it just doesn't feel quite enough to see my colleagues on Zoom anymore. It doesn't feel quite enough to see your faces on Zoom like this. And so then my mind starts to fantasize about what I might eat <laughs> or what I might give myself a break to go have a piece of chocolate or something like that. Right. So this sensual desire, this wanting mind can really cover some emotional patterns that are there. And we've all seen this, that the urge to fight back when we're hurt. Any happen to anybody? <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Yeah, it's like so natural, right? Like, oh, I'll, I don't want to get hurt. I'm not going to be annihilated. And so let me quit blast back. And this is ill will that is kind of protecting the heart from that feeling, the sensitivity of hurt. And then these expressions of stupor, lethargy, we might think of stupor as a mental quality and lethargy as a physical one. So these low energy states, strategies of the mind to shut down, to not deal with what's going on, feeling disappointed or discouraged or apathetic or depressed, just wanting to kind of disappear, all of these, these ways that the heart protects from feeling into the pain of the moment. 
And then restlessness and regret might cover up facing, you know, another way of covering up facing difficulty. Regret is so difficult to deal with, isn't it? I mean, personal regret is difficult to deal with. And for me, what's been up recently, I mean, recently meaning like the last decade <laughs> and for sure the last year is like facing the reality of regret in the collective, like the, all of the violence, all of the expressions of hatred, so much regret from this heart, like whoa, for humanity, like we, we don't know how to do better. There's so much regret there. It makes it hard. To, that is a very difficult feeling. It's hard to connect there. So then there are all these dodges that the mind comes up with, you know, like, oh, you just turn away from that. Let me get up and move around. Let me think about something else, distract the mind, distract with something, an expression of restlessness sometimes to cover up that feeling of regret. And then this fifth one, doubt or indecision, can often be felt when we don't want to make a hard choice. We don't want to commit. It's too scary. So doubt or indecision covers up that fear. It's too scary to do this. It's too hard to commit. I don't want, I don't want to make a mistake. Not facing what needs to happen. So doubt protects from that. And these five hindrances or obstacles overwhelm. They are often stronger than the awareness that we're cultivating. Right? So we as practitioners, we are cultivating this habit of awareness to be awake more and more frequently in our daily lives, throughout our lives, so that we can be more honest and sincere, so that we can have some choice in what ethical decisions that we make. And often it's the, that these, because they have such deep roots, that these hindrances are stronger than the force of awareness and they overwhelm awareness. This is, the Buddha said this about the hindrances. These five obstacles, hindrances, overwhelm awareness, awareness and weaken discernment, weaken wisdom, which five? Sensual desire is an obstacle, a hindrance that overwhelms awareness and weakens discernment. And he says the same thing about ill will. Ill will is an obstacle, a hindrance that overwhelms awareness and weakens discernment. And the same thing about, um, Sloth and torpor is this translation, but stupor and lethargy is the phrase I, or the words I've been using. Sloth and torpor, sloth and drowsiness. Same thing about restlessness and anxiety or worry. And the same thing about uncertainty or uh, doubt. So doubt is an obstacle, a hindrance that overwhelms awareness and weakens discernment. And he goes on to say, these are the five obstacles hindrances that overwhelm awareness and weaken discernment. And when a person has not abandoned these five obstacles, hindrances that overwhelm awareness and weaken discernment, when they are without strength and weak in discernment, for them to understand what, what is for their own benefit, to understand what is for the benefit of others, to understand what is for the benefit of both, a truly noble distinction uh, to really, I'm sorry, to realize a superior human state, a truly noble distinction and knowledge and vision that is impossible. So what the Buddha is saying that it's not possible when the mind is filled with these hindrances to understand what is for our own benefit and what is for another person's benefit. It's not possible to discern the actions that we need to take when the mind is flooded with these hindrances. So there's like a beautiful ethical dimension right here in this teaching. And it really points to that the more we take care of our own hearts, the more we 
train in sensitivity, the more we build the capacity to be with even the deepest roots of these expressions of greed, of hatred and delusion, that it is, of, it is for the benefit, not just of ourselves, but of each other. There's so many expressions of greed and hatred and delusion in our, that we're reckoning with currently. And we can, I mean, just in the last couple of weeks, you know, the heart has really been moved by the, uh, the murders in Atlanta. You know, this, I've been kind of obsessed with jury selection and the trial of Derek Chauvin and understanding legal things and the, the forces of whiteness in the legal system. And then just, you know, a couple of days ago, this mass shooting in Boulder. On top of that, my cat is not, my cat is aging and not doing that well. You know, just in all of the personal manifestations of difficulty in our own lives. So we've got all of this happening in the collective that we're reckoning with and then the individual impacts. It's a lot. There are a lot of challenges. I've been reading this uh, book by Rob Berbea with a couple of Dharma friends from my um, teacher training cohort. And he calls the hindrances manifestations of our humanity. Manifestations of our humanity. You know, generally when I think of hindrances, I think they're like a threat to humanity or I think of something like that. But manifestations of our humanity really call for us to have a different relationship to difficulty for all of the expressions of difficulty. Seeing them as natural forces, natural expressions of this heart of this heart, the possibility in every heart that is represented in the collective of misunderstanding, of wrong view, of moments of non-mindfulness. Non and we can see how that happens right here. We can see how it happens outside of us too. And so taking these hindrances personally only makes them stronger. And so in this call to relate differently to them, to pull them close, like, oh, this is about our humanity, man a manifestation of our humanity rather than something that I have to hate or force away or reject or use as another strategy or, um, reason to condemn another human being, we see these as something that unites us all. The force of greed that flows through this heart, the force of hatred that flows through this heart, the force of delusion that flows through this heart, the force of greed that flows through humanity, the force of hatred that flows through humanity, the force of confusion that flows through humanity. And when we can appreciate, embrace even that this is true, what is left? Well, for me, it feels like what's left is taking responsibility. Like I'm gonna take responsibility for this heart. I'm actually gonna take responsibility for what's moving in the collective also because this heart has contributed to that. So what is left, responsibility and care. Allowing the heart to break, to be really sensitive, cultivating sensitivity so that can really see deeply into the roots and take care profoundly. It was a, a friend, um, wrote something, she, a friend who we um, did a Dharma program together many years ago, 
and she lives in Boulder and she wrote something about her experience um, in Boulder just today. And I thought it was such a, a beautiful uh, description of what it's like to relate differently to the hindrances as if they are a force in humanity, as if they are our teacher, something that helps us wake up and learn how to take responsibility, learn how to care deeply. And here's what she said. Surreal day, the place, the street we practically live on that was violated yesterday turned into a place for tears, healing, beauty, and sacred remembrance. The place that experienced the worst that humans can engage in today became a place for the best humans can do. We came out with our broken wings and hugged each other. I started the day with feeling numb and unable to move and then ended up spending the day talking to over 50 people as individuals or groups. As a community, we lost neighbors, our children, our beloved grocery store staff, beloved artists. So we went over who, who knew whom. When was the last time we met Terry? Last time Ricky greeted us, or Lona? We spoke of numbness, tiredness, disbelief, past and current trauma, PTSD, fear of grocery stores, hopelessness, anger and fear, and also love of our children and care of each other, of each other. Boulder air is thick with grief and healing is also in the air. This heart sensitivity becomes the most necessary, most essential value beyond our views and beliefs, beyond our conceptions. And so in this song, how deep is your love? It really reminds me of what is needed. Like what is the kind of care that's needed to do this really noble work? This is not easy. It's not easy to come face to face with all the most difficult things. And often when we do that, there's so much more that's opened up for us as was expressed in this beautiful expression that I read from, the numbness, the fear, the tiredness, the disbelief, all past and current wounds, hopelessness, anger, and love. Love is right there, the possibility of love the possibility of connection is right there in the midst of it all. Well, thank you for listening tonight, friends. I would add that that fear, that that impatient thought is its own experience, right? That thought like, oh, what if I have to feel that hypothetical thing a bazillion times? You know, that is like, that's not it. You know, like if we're talking about anxiety, that's not anxiety, that's something totally, that's anticipation or dread, or so it's its own unique experience right then. So perhaps, and but in a moment, 
this is something I've learned over and over, is that the actual experience of anxiety is different than the fear of anxiety or the anticipation of anxiety or the dread of anxiety, right? So sometimes we have to learn that too, that, oh, anxiety feels workable a lot of the time. It doesn't feel pleasant, but a lot of the time it feels workable. And even when it didn't feel workable and actually, you know, this has been my experience in the past. There have been moments in my life when I wasn't that functional, for example. Even in those moments, it's hard to believe that anxiety is not workable because there's something, there was some capacity to get through it, even if it felt hard. So that anticipation of a difficult moment is its own thing, its own kind of dukkha. The difficult moment is its own thing and that fear or the dread or the anticipation of that is its own thing. So it can be useful to, to remember that, like, oh, this is just dread or this is just anticipation. It doesn't mean that that thing, that target is gonna be what the anticipation tells me it's gonna be because anticipation is its own experience. Yeah. Thank you.